actually I should probably try to share my screen there. All right, you're good to go. All right, welcome everyone. This is another edition of the uh, DSC community call. So just a very quick summary um, from uh, last one, if you haven't noticed, we've uh, created a website that we released um, six weeks ago-ish. And it's got a lot of information on We also have a new blog post. If you look uh, in home and then you have uh, in the blog area, you've got uh, Raymond Andre, who's a PFE in Germany, who created a blog post about how he solved the um, uh, the maintenance window issue with DSC. So how to have a way to creating a maintenance window using DSC. So he created the post and he shared the links to the uh, GitHub repository so that you can uh, see how he's doing it. And he explains quite a lot. It's a bit lengthy, but uh, that's a very good information, how to create a maintenance window. And um, he's using it with some of his customers. So feel free to have a look. And I will link to that here. Uh, no, the screen. I will. I will share the screen right now. I was actually setting up because I forgot to do it. Uh, but let me just do this now because I've got two screens. Otherwise, a bit too big to share. I thought I was prepared, but I'm not. There we go. Let me know if you need me to share. Can you see it now? I see that you are starting to share. Yay, it's a good start. Yep. Oh, let me just close some of this it. stuff. You can see it? Yeah, yeah I can see it as it is. All right, so that's, uh, so that's the blog uh, on the website that Raymond created and it shows you um, what the problem he had with his customers uh, trying to have a maintenance window that's been, I think Michael can probably watch for it, but it's been a feature request for quite some time. It's been the time. And, <laughs> yes. So uh, that's one of the, that's the first article we've got, actually. Uh, I knew he was solving that problem and I asked him to kindly blog about it and, and explain what he was doing. So it's not a change in the LCM. So it works with the uh, WMF uh, 5.1. Uh, it's just a, a one way of uh, of solving this issue by changing the LCM settings uh, with the DSC resource. So within a DSC resource and within um, that's a composite resource actually, and um, he explains how he's is changing the settings to create a maintenance window. So that's a very nice article. If you've got this problem, then feel free to have a look. And if you want to blog as well uh, on this website, feel free to submit or just talk to us. Come on the Slack channel again and, and talk to us and we can uh, we can see, we can help you blog and we can just say, yeah, that's a good content or, or, or ask a few questions and stuff. So if any questions, just come in on the Slack channel. Uh, it's PowerShell. Uh, we'll put the link again because I keep forgetting. I think it's uh, slack.poshcode.org and then you can, or .com, and then you find the PowerShell Slack channel. You should already be on there. And we've got a DSC channel within this. And uh, this is the website I was talking earlier. So that's the website we've got. We've got some information, uh, information about what the community is about that we covered last call. But uh, if you need more information, feel free to go and, and browse this site. If you think it's missing some information, if you think uh, we need to add more help, more details, where to get some information, then feel free to let us know. And uh, we are happy to make the changes. Everything's on GitHub, so you can also uh, create a pull request, fix typos, or add new content. Uh, it's just uh, uh, markdown files. It's not HTML. It's just um, this is a Yuga template. So um, if you go to the community call at the top on next call, we've got the agenda. And obviously, anyone can update the agenda uh, by uh, submitting a PR to change uh, to generate the content and uh, this is the resource we've got to be released and then we've got a few points to discuss actually it's maybe not even the latest version anyway there we go so uh, just refresh yeah, 
Yeah, have Have you updated to Gale, or otherwise it should be latest? Yeah, just I just updated right now. Okay. So that, that I just uh, press F five and know it's uh, installed. Uh, cool. And uh, Johan put on the Slack channel the um, the, the link to uh, to the Slack, so that's perfect. Yeah. So. Uh, first of all, the resources to be released. So uh, at the moment, we go into we we are changing the way we release. So we are transferring uh, all the PowerShell uh, PowerShell organization to the DSC community organization. But while we're building this uh, automation on the new pipeline, we are we're still in transition. So at the moment, we will aim to do um, the same way as we did last time. So uh, Michael is going to. Release the um, uh, release the DSC resources as the resource kit as we've done before, but we will try in the meantime to also uh, transition everything. So transfer the ownership to the DSC community, transfer the repositories to the DSC community, and change the way we release those resources. And this is one of the last thing uh, we are going to talk about today. So for the resource to be released. Um, Maybe Johan, you've got some comments. That you want to read. Or Daniel, I have a actually. question for the maintainers uh, before we go through each of them. Uh, yes. Somebody mentioned that in last month's process, the packages were not published as releases in GitHub. If I understood their concern correctly, um, so it might there yeah. might be a step missing from the script. I just wanted to understand what I should correct. It's Look, um, yeah, hi, Michael. Yeah, it looks like there was a. It, it may have been that the tags against the Git commits didn't get made. I think that's what Gail, you you had, had a quick look and thought that was the case, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it's missing the Git tags. Um, I haven't checked the automation scripts, uh, but uh, but I'm, I th that I think that was like a, something else to do. It may it might not have been in the in the uh, document KT provided you. Okay. Michael. Okay, I'll look into it and uh, just make sure that I'm thinking correctly. Next Wednesday will be our next resource kit uh, release. Yes, that, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll double check that by then. I'm just taking notes. Sorry. And uh, anything else to anything else? Any other questions you want to raise, Michael? No, that was it. Thank you. Johan, Dan, do you want to? Take the resource to be released from there. Sure. Yep. Uh, so we have a couple of resources to be released: uh, Active Directory DSC. Uh, we have Computer Management DSC, and that has a breaking change with scheduled task. It's a pretty idiot. It's a pretty minor breaking change. It's we're just actually just removing some of the uh, unneeded parameters from the get. Um, so it's it's not going to break most people's configs unless you're actually calling get directly. Yeah, cool. And DFC, DSC, uh, not sure. I think we had this up last time. Uh, this probably should be released just to get the examples published, but that's the only change actually. So uh, we have network DSC. Uh, SharePoint DC, I don't know if it's going to be released. We will see if uh, it's Brian so, on so the call, you're like, maybe. Yeah, you like just said SharePoint DC won't release this time due to the vacation period. So there are very little changes. So I guess that's going to wait for the next release cycle, or that's going to wait for SharePoint DSC to be to be on its own release cadence. So uh, I'll get into more details in a bit, but the idea is that we will make the release uh, independently, because on the last call, when we asked uh, maintainers and users what they wanted, uh, they said like independent and more frequent releases would be better. So we will discuss that in a bit anyway. Yep. Uh, cool. Uh, storage DEC, uh, VME namespace security DEC, uh, which was formerly known as VME namespace security. This one, I think, is. It's an older. I I, re, I don't really know why we haven't released this before because uh, I think this has never been released, so we have to check in on that if we sh we should uh, release it. But maybe it needs something more to be released. Uh, we have XDNS DNS server, X failover cluster, X Hyper V, X PSD side state configuration, 
X remote desktop session host, X SCSMA, and X web administration. Then we have the deprecated resources. Uh, these are actually moved to computer management DCs, which will be released. They are in the release uh, this time. Uh, X remote desktop admin, that one has been moved, but we have not yet merge a PR that says it's deprecated, so we have to get on to that this week, so we can release that one as well. Uh, so, an expanding reboot, the same there, that one has, has been mentioned in the in the repo that it has been deprecated. So these, those that are deprecated should also be released. Uh, so they are clear in PowerShell Gallery that they are deprecated. Mm. Yeah, so uh, I know Daniel, uh, either you and me uh, need to <coughs> push a, a PR there. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to do that because I did the pending reboot one, so yeah, it's fresh in my head. Yep. Okay. Uh, so that's it. Yeah, for this time. Okay. Uh, is, uh, so we can, we, maybe we can ask if, if is there anyone in the on the call that knows we should release someone else that have we missed. Nothing else? I haven't had a chance to go look. Uh, did anyone find capacity to go look at doing a Windows capability resource for computer management? Uh, no. Okay. I've yes, it. yes uh, they did. Yes, there is. Oh, really? uh, someone said they're working on it. Um, I saw it last night. Uh, let me get back to you in a moment. But yeah, I've got a, I've got a mention here saying, hey, I've, I'm working on this. On, on this point, actually, I wanted to raise that um, between PSDSU resource and the XPS desired state configuration modules, uh, they, I wanted just to clarify because uh, we've got a few requests and, and I think we said it before, but maybe it wasn't clear enough and then it's good to repeat this. Uh, PSDSU resources is the new place for what the built-in modules from, from Microsoft on Windows is about so that means they have to keep PS DSC resource all the resources within that module to uh, be a like for like for what you have in box. The reason for that is if they have a support calls, if the DSC team has a support call about a DSC resource, they need to maybe fix that resource. But it needs to be a like for like um, uh, a like for like change for the inbox resource. That means we can't have any breaking change for those because of support reasons. So that means every new feature and uh, every changes uh, should go to XPS desired state configuration module. Did I say that right? Is it clear enough? Michael, any things to add on that? I th you said it right. Okay, no mistake. So I hope that's clear. If you have any more questions or if we can make it a bit more clear, uh, feel free to let us know how. So let's yeah, was, let's uh, was, add that to the release uh, to the notes to this community call as well, so we can point to it. Good point. Yeah, I should take notes on. I don't know why I'm taking notes on paper for once, but okay, hold. I'll just do it. I'm writing yeah, a it was, couple of it notes. It was it was yeah, sure. who who uh, volunteered to create the um, create the Windows capability resource. Oh, okay. So that's going to be done in um, in computer management DSC. That is awesome. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So you said it's Bartek? OTEC, O-U-T-E-K. Oh, okay. Okay. okay, sorry. Yeah, he's, he's been doing a lot of other stuff so as well, so lots of other commits. All right, that's great. The scenario that's um, really key there is uh, to add the built-in SSH server in Server 2019. That is add or enable or add uh, Windows capability instead of Windows feature. So having a resource for that, uh, for my test scripts and things like that, I'm just being lazy and using a script resource, which is not what you're supposed to do. But uh, having a Windows capability resource will be really fantastic. It'll unlock that scenario. I'll see if we can get, fa get that fast track. Yeah, I'd be happy to contribute on it. I'll go back and look at the issue again. I'll let, let OTEC know. This just came up. So, 
Uh, okay, so Johan, you were you wanted to talk about uh, leaving unsupported OS to be treated as breaking change. Yeah, uh, we have a like Active Directory DEC. Uh, in the documentation, it says that we uh, support the Windows Server 2008 R2. Um, uh, we should probably remove that uh, when the extended support is is removed and I was wondering should we treat that as a breaking change it we actually doesn't remove the support but uh, the community support for it 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 it's just uh, if it works it works but we won't test anything that it works on Windows Server 2008 or two um, so if the community feels that this is a breaking change or a natural transition for the module any opinion? I, I rather not to have a breaking change. Okay. Anyone else? Someone? Okay. okay. My, I think that um, unless 2008 R2 has been explicitly supported and tested against, then it should not be. It should not be a breaking change. Uh, I mean, if you say, yeah, this DSC resource is uh, working and tested against 2000 R2, if you change that and you're not testing anymore and it actually breaks, then you should say like that might be a breaking change. But I don't think we've got any resource that does this. Usually we say like it's a best effort, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but we don't test specifically on 2008 R2. So I think that should not be a breaking change. But maybe we should be a bit more specific on to what uh, server OS we are testing against. But there's a lot of things we should do to improve the integration tests anyway, so I think yeah, that's a bit difficult to do now. Yeah, but that's a good point uh, to actually show what uh, we're testing against. Uh, I think it's only I think it's only SharePoint DEC that actually test on, to, no, a SQL Server DEC also tests on two different uh, OSs, I think, so. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, it's not really clear in the documentation about that we do, which OSS we test on. Uh, no resource or testing on Windows Server 2008 or 2 in the, the uh, DAC resource yeah. kit today. Yeah. There are no build workers for that OS. Yeah. Yeah, so we need to do better in integration testing in general. We knew that already. Yeah. So we need we need an easier way. We'll work on that. We'll work on that. We've got plans, but. Uh, takes time and oh yeah gallery account as well Johan you've been working on that the last couple of days the gallery account for the yeah, DC community yes, sorry uh, uh, actually is this is one is for Jason has a, a repo that he's one uh, want to release uh, actually in a week yeah, or within a week. Yeah, and maybe if Jason hears me, maybe you can post a link to that repo so we can see it. Uh, so, uh, he, he, sorry. I think Jason is on the call. Yeah, I'm here. I'll give you that link. Yep. Cool. So, uh, this is uh, the first uh, repo in the, in the DC community. And we just added the uh, upvoice support, uh, but now Jason need to release this one. So, actually, set up a PowerShell Gallery account, and if it's okay with the community, I will encrypt that uh, API key and every module in this uh, organization can be released using that. Yeah, so, so that brings a bigger automation. Yeah. Yeah, that brings a bigger question, which is uh, how we will manage secrets for the community to be released. So at the moment, uh, um, uh, Michael has the keys to the uh, PowerShell gallery, and so to release to the PowerShell gallery, and and that's with him. So that means whatever he releases, like he, we trust what he does. So he's the one releasing. Uh, the code. So when we change it and we own by the DSC community, we need to find ways to 
keep this uh, secret. So uh, we need to make sure that the secret is not shared with everyone because we don't want anyone to just release um, a change and we need to make sure that whatever is being changed um, has been reviewed by someone else. So we need to find the right process to make sure everyone trusts the release. So I don't think that uh, we can discuss if you've got some ideas right now, but otherwise that's something that we probably need an RFC for a DSC community RFC, not a PowerShell RFC. Um, but, uh, but we need something to make sure we have the right process and we hide that key to some extent uh, in the right way. So if you have any suggestion, feel free to discuss maybe on the Slack or maybe now. Otherwise, we need to uh, we need to find ways to do this. So I'm on the GP registry policy DSC, which is uh, the one uh, the, the repository JSON is working on. And I guess the branch he's been working on is dev base. They're still working on the uh, CI integration. There we go. So as you can see, that's pretty new. So that's a new resource uh, Jason is working on. I think it makes sense to just encrypt them in F there, and then um, the encrypted version, <coughs> the uh, the string that they give you to substitute in, uh, it's only going to work if whoever is in charge of bringing these new uh, projects in has added them in app there. So when their build runs, it would automatically go get the keys. I don't know how to address the second part that you mentioned, which is making sure that we have sign off uh, from like multiple maintainers before a new release goes out. Um, so, so that's the thing. So um, by having this, an, a maintainer can release any module. So that's the only that the downside, right? So if a maintainer approves some dodgy code, then uh, then it can release the dodgy code to the gallery. But that means we need to trust the maintainers. So the, the maintainers so, is a very little, a small list of people. But is there anything we can do to improve the trust and to make sure we trust what's happening? We can we can uh, I think is the easiest um, easiest is to actually require a maintainer to first of all require PRs require a maintainer to, to review uh, be, be, before we can merge a PR uh, so we merge so we release on a merge to master master will be a protected branch and yeah. then we require a review on PRs uh, towards master yeah. that's what you say right does that it's, I, I think this is it's the easiest to, yeah, at least to to start. Uh, we can uh, we can surely add more later if needed, but uh, we we can't make the administration too heavy either. We are yeah. only a few people. If so. everything, if everyone's happy with this, I'm happy with that because I think that's good enough. If we enforce a, a second, uh, mm -hmm. like someone to review it, then I think that's good enough. I take yeah. that as a yes. Yeah, right. I'll take that as a yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Before I jump to, so, no, sorry, another one. Maintenance window. No, it's not the one. Close that one. Close that one. All right. Is there anything else people want to discuss before I go to the next bit? Or does it, do you have any question? Mm, that depends on what the next bit is, uh, Gil. <laughs> You'll love it. Uh, the next bit is releasing the, the way we will change the releases from no one. So I want to have a high level discussion on on what what where we are at now, what we're doing, what needs to change and how uh, we plan to change it. So what do you what did you want to talk about, uh, Daniel? Uh, the outcome of the survey, but uh, I guess we can do that at the end. I forgot. Oh, sorry. I completely forgot to prepare it. Um, and I forgot to talk to Michael. <laughs> oh, that, that's what we're I, here I for, right? For next time. Yeah. Um, Michael, is there like is there anything? Did we lose you this for a second, there, Gail. Anything we could share now? It might have been what you were 
saying? Uh, can you guys still hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I haven't, it's actually been a few weeks since I've gone and looked at the results. Uh, the last time that I did, uh, we had a good number of responses, like several hundred, and uh, it was a good distribution across sizes of organizations, number of nodes being managed, a surprising number of responses from people who aren't using DSC at all. Um, there was a good interest, as you would expect, in uh, like hybrid solutions, uh, what we're going to be doing with DSC, um, basically outside of Azure and to enable the community. Uh, so we, we actually had a good talk about some of those things at the DSC camp. Uh, the Invoke DSC resource RFC is obviously public now, so that, um, that's gotten a lot of good feedback, uh, I think, as a result of you know, having that survey out there and kind of drawing attention to uh, how we can support the community and, and how we can enable DSC to, to go forward on its own. Um, we, we probably need to do, I think, uh, so for the next call, I'll put something together that's better prepared and actually go through the survey results. Um, I don't have any trouble with just publishing the results. Um, but we also should go through the Invoke DSC resource RFC which I think by then might be ready to officially merge in. Uh, Gail, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, Time-wise, yes, we should be pretty close, and we've had really good feedback on the RFC. Yes, and um, unlike we, so I worked with um, uh, with Travis to look at like the, the challenges we have. So we know we know some of the challenges we have and what we need to do about them. And then we can also uh, talk about that maybe next call. And the reason I'm pinning those two together is, uh, you know, the results of the RFC would lead us to believe that the DSC community would like to make it clear what are we doing to make sure that uh, the community is never blocked from continuing and being successful on its own. And by community, I mean, obviously, everything that we're doing here, but also just using DSC as a standalone tool. Uh, and then uh, the Invoke DSC resource RFC uh, really provides, uh, through all of that feedback, what is one technical solution that we could take forward that would make sure DSC can uh, move forward on its own and that it fully empowers the community to continue uh, with, with the same commitment that we've had in, you know, thus far, where uh, there, there's then all the resources that have been built continue to move forward, that custom solutions can be built on top of DSC, things like that. So uh, this probably needs to be a blog post in the DSC community site. Yeah, maybe I'll reach out to um, uh, to Jason Helmick actually to maybe do a video or something so yeah. then we can show a bit more of this. I was going to say, Gail, whenever you uh, whenever the two of us are in the same place, anything that we can do together that would help, certainly. Yeah, you're not coming to PS Confusia next week, unfortunately. <laughs> no, I'm not, but I'm sure we can figure something out. Yeah, that's a good point. We'll try something out. And um, uh, I want to say, I oh, am. Yeah. So yeah, I think uh, Travis put it uh, when we were while we were discussing about this. Say like, this is really investment to to DSC as a platform. And, and that's why, like, we trying to make sure the platform, DSC as a platform, is uh, is enabled for PowerShell 7. So, um, so, so that's the idea is to make sure on PowerShell 7, then you can use, uh, you can reuse the DSC in the platform. So it's not going to be the LCM, but that's going to be uh, something else. So look at the RFC, and if you have uh, more questions, feel free to. Uh, uh, add them to uh, the next community calls agenda. When yeah, there is one point for the RFC that I would like to um, just ask uh, everybody in the DSC community to consider going out and taking a look at making a comment. Uh, currently, the thinking is that Invoke DSC resource in PowerShell 7 would actually execute in the context of the local user, um, which has been something people have asked about for a long time. Could you run DSC resources in the security context of a user. Uh, so then if you wanted to use it for something like testing while you're developing and debugging resources, you would want to combine it with psexec-s to run it as local system, which is not a big deal. Uh, if 
as long as you know that ahead of time and you're prepared to do it that way. So um, that's just something I wanted to kind of get people thinking about because currently invoke DSC resource is going to behave like LCM and Reddit's local system. This would be, a, depending on how you look at it, it could be a pro or a con. So maybe take some time and just think about it. And then if you have strong opinion, uh, the, the RFC PR would be a great place to make sure that's reported. Feel free to ask if any questions as well. If you're not too sure, that would behave. And maybe I wasn't clear when I when when I drafted the RFC. Like add add a comment. So say maybe something needs to be clarified. Well, I would expect invoke DSC resource to also work from a, well, say a scheduled task or something like that, right? That you can basically run it in any context you like it in. Yes. So that's the idea. The idea is we can't really. So if you want invoke DSC resource to work cross platform, that means on Linux, Mac, and something else, like we are limited by some of the technologies we're doing. So uh, um, in Linux, as an example, you need to have a complete uh, different process ID to have a different user account running it uh, because of the way Linux and Unix systems works. And that means uh, you can't have the same kind of impersonation that you have uh, in Windows. So uh, that means you will need to run another exe process, PowerShell.exe as an example, or pwsh.exe on Windows. So that's why uh, like there's ways to wrap it around, let's say with PowerShell jobs as an example, or maybe having a different implementation, slightly different implementation when you do on Linux on when you do on Windows. But uh, that's not something, first of all, for the initial work that we can do, maybe. I think that's going to be difficult. We can fix it later if we know exactly where to go. But in the meantime, uh, maybe the invoke DSC resource will only run within the current user scope. So then it's easier to troubleshoot. And then, as you said, you can wrap it around uh, with a scheduled task. And if So uh, Michael mentioned PS exec. I would like to mention uh, something. I think it's Mark Kellerman uh, who wrote invoke uh, command as, and you can run thing as systems and as other users. So that could be used to wrap around the invoke DSC resource. But that would be up to the user, at least to start with, that would be up to the user to implement. Hopefully, we would provide maybe an invoke DSC resource as that could be a proxy command for invoke DSC resource and managing it, or maybe that could be a community contribution. Uh, this is open, but um, but yeah, we'd like to have your opinion on this. Yeah. And uh, following up on that, is is there are there any plans on how Invoke DC resource will will output what it is actually doing? So I th I think I asked that in the Slack channel to you for okay. Do we have an idea that it's going to, for example, put logs like uh, the the detailed JSON logs that we now get in the Configuration status folder. You mean in the event logs? No, it doesn't do this. So um, the N output... not necessarily the, the event logs, but if it's uh, in uh, in the JSON file, so where, where we now get it in configuration status, that that would be perfect. So no, uh, what's happening is because you're running in the current uh, process then it is using the uh, you know the verbals the, the verbal streams and the other streams right so you can if you hook into those streams then you can uh, get this information everything else because there's no lcm anymore it's only calling the get set and test functions or in in when it when it's about the classes then it's only the methods right but it's not doing anything else, so that means it's just pure PowerShell. So you know uh, when it's a, uh, when it does write verbals, then you get the verbals from the verbal stream. So you can capture that the same way you would do on any script, but it's not doing it for you. Does that make sense? Yes and no, because, well, this is also just a wrapper around it, right? So we could have it do something extra. Mm -hmm. 
we could. Uh, that probably should not be into the Invoke DSC resource, but that probably should be into something like the Invoke DSC resource as or something else. So the idea is uh, we're trying to have the atomic function that shouldn't work and that everyone should rely on, but then um, everything beyond that should probably be another comment. Maybe in the same module, but maybe not. So we're just trying to make sure we're not tightly coupling things. And then we want to make sure that uh, whatever we do makes sense and makes sense in different um, uh, OSs and in different uh, scenarios. OK, gotcha. Yeah, so but uh, do like if there's information you really want to see, I would really suggest you add to this RFC so that at least we capture that the, the what you really would like to see in there. So maybe it is not going to be into the Invoke DSC resource, but maybe that would be calling for another RFC later to say, well, we need something else to get this information. And that information should be standardized. Cool. Yeah, I'll do that. Any other question? All right, take that as no. All right, so I wanted to talk quickly about um, about releasing vnext. So currently uh, it's centrally done. So Michael and, and when Katie is there, Katie usually uh, run all the scripts to look at all the DSC resources uh, repositories and then do the release for them. That means that we look um, every six weeks, look, is there any, any uh, pull request to uh, master from dev and then take those, compile the change logs, change the module version, and uh, publish uh, creating the packages and then release that releasing this to the Parachain gallery and um, that has that has some drawbacks first of all it's quite a bit of work uh, it, it takes some times for Michael on things and that means you have to wait to get the releases like when there's a change you need to wait up to six weeks ish to get the release out and if you do the change just after the release let's say you do that in uh, a week and a day from now, then you will have to wait the full six weeks. So uh, to change that and to maybe be a bit faster, we want to have something a bit more streamlined. So we want to not having a centrally managed uh, release process, but we want to have each resource modules to be released independently. So whenever there's a change, and um, so instead of having a dev branch, you just have a master branch, and you f you create a branch from there, uh, which is a feature branch. And then when you merge or when you create your pull request to merge to master, uh, when it's been approved by the maintainer, it should automatically release that version. So it doesn't have to be a main release. It could be a pre-release if we use Semba. Yesterday, hello, can you hear me? Can we lose Gail? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think so. I've just had an my mic wasn't working. Is it okay now? Yeah. Okay. I can hear you. So um so that's the idea. The goal is to have a scripted pipeline that works identically on your machine, on Avia, on, on Asia. So then whenever you want to run the process, you know exactly what's going on. Um, currently, this is pretty much how it works. Um, but it's not really unified across all the repositories. And the release process is also not accessible. So you don't see and you can't contribute to the release process. So let's say someone wants to add um, the signing of the modules. You can't because you don't really know what we're doing in the background. So we want to be more transparent and we want to open up for contribution and, and some of the maintainers. So we need to change the way we're doing things. And at the moment, and I'm, and I'm working on a module template to create uh, this pipeline, which is just some scripts. And um, it should just be changing the way we release and we execute uh, the tests. As an example, currently for the DSA resources, the tests uh, coming from DSA resource.test is just a Git clone. Uh, ideally, we want to move this to be a module that is released and versioned. So then when you run this, it pulls the latest version of that module, and then you can execute the tests of that module instead of having to do a git clone and not really knowing which commit ID you're using. So that's what. Uh, Mark, mute. 
your microphone. There. And uh, so, so that's the process I want. So you first don't know the required modules needed for the build. So let's say you not necessarily have all the modules on your system. So the build system, the build script should automatically pull the modules, the required modules. And then you should build your module and sometimes just creating an output folder, putting the, the source into that folder and updating the module version, updating the change log, which is at the moment done by the scripts uh, Michael is running, but making sure that you can see exactly what's happening. Then on this compiled module, validate again the guidelines, PS script analyzer, uh, running the unit test, running the integration tests when it makes sense, um, validate uh, the compiled module against quality standards, so the HQRM standards as an example, making sure you've got enough test coverage and not only relying on um, maybe codecurve.io as an example, as we currently do and making sure you've got the right documentation on the right help as uh, currently done. No, with... Sorry, say again. Ah, okay, no, that was, that was it. Um, and, and then making sure, um, so making sure the change log, the version, sorry, I just uh, lost my train of thoughts. Yeah, the quality standards at the moment, the help and documentation is done by uh, documentation helper, is that the right name, Daniel? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and, uh, and and we need to make sure like we have consistent help and, and good quality help because that helps uh, uh, for, for the HKRM standards is mandatory anyway, most of it at least, or should be. And then eventually we want to add a package signing uh, for the DSC community, so then it's uh, slightly more trustable. And then we want also to make sure we create GitHub release, which we're not doing at the moment, we're only tagging, but we want to make sure we tag and probably create GitHub release, uh, especially if we're doing, um, doing pre-releases or branch releases as well. Uh, that's the kind of things we can do. And publish the combined module to the gallery as a pre-release and save the test results on artifact. So then for every build which is going to be released, even if it's a pre-release, we know that we have the test results. We know which tests have been running. We know which one was successful, if anyone failed. And we have uh, some other information like the um, cut coverage and things like this. And then we should probably check in with, um, uh, we could bring this up at like one of the next PowerShell uh, conferences or DevOps summits, but uh, someone like PowerShell.org might consider sponsoring a certificate that we could use for signing all community uh, releases. That would be really, really good. I think we would have no problem finding people to to do this uh, in the DSC community as well. So we can just like having a Patreon or something. And, and that's definitely, I think the problem at the moment is uh, making it transparent and then so then we have the code and we can have the process to sign it and, and to test when it's signed. But yeah, yeah. I already talked to uh, to the PowerShell.org people about this. <laughs> so so yeah, there's there's a lot of things we can do on that area. But then the idea is so we release so every time there's a change merge to master, it's automatically released to the PowerShell gallery as a pre-release. And that's the key element. So if you make a change and the maintainer uh, merges it, then it can go as a pre-release. So if you really want that one, you can just install the pre-release. When you want an actual release, then you have to wait for the actual release. And there's different ways to go about the actual release. I think the best way is when the maintainer decides that the pre-release is uh, good quality, it's been used for some time without any issue reported, then uh, they can tag a current release, like a current pre-release, and then automatically it will use the package that's been compiled already, not from the source, from the package that's been tested. It will uh, change the module manifest on the new spec and repackage it, make sure it, um, it works with the same tests. So make sure we didn't break the package and then release that former pre-release to a release state. And then making sure obviously we update GitHub, we tag the repository and things like this. So does that make sense? And is it something that people think like the process is OK? It's a bit more involved than what we used to do because it was, let's say, managed by uh, Katie and Michael now. 
So it's going to be more independent, but that should provide uh, quicker uh, quicker changes to the repository. So when there's a change coming in the uh, module, you can use it much more quicker. Does that make sense? Is it something people would like to see? Uh, as an open question, do, do you feel that the pre-release is something that we really need? Um, do we really need it? Uh, sorry, that mic issue. Do we really need it? Um, no, we could go like the, the, it's, a, it's a matter of trust. So some people may not want to have um, a pre-release uh, that changes every day or every two days, right? So those people don't really want to update that often. They want to take a bit more time between releases. And that's why pre-release for every changes probably would help them, ease them. And then we can also change the way we do the actual releases. We can keep them on a schedule. That means if you want to really change every day, fine. You change every day with a pre-release. If you want to change every six weeks, then we can release a new version every six weeks. Not a pre-release, just a version. Make sense? We don't have to. That's something for the community to decide, to be honest. We can go either way. Yeah, it, it was a bit... I, I saw the first module coming that then has a pre-release for six months. It So it, it wouldn't change. So for us, it's it depends. Um, so the question would be, what would qualify for a pre-release and what would qualify for an actual release? If you think every change, which is merged to master, is okay to be an actual release, then it's okay to be an actual release and we don't need any of the pre-releases. But that means people will have to deal with packages changing every few days. Yeah, if so they will need to get a version number what they're actually loading. Yes, so they would, okay. be, they would need to be pinning, for instance. Yeah, yeah exactly. Not, which is which is okay, and I actually recommend pinning when you're doing DSE configurations, but you don't have to. Yes, and this, uh, yeah, this this uh, probably is per uh, module, right? So one module can use uh, pre-releases, but another module doesn't need to do that. Yes, that's the other thing. We would make this uh, independent. Uh, Bartek, can you go and mute or say something? I think. Yeah, you better now, right? I think it's Bartek. There's a lot yeah. of uh, noise on the thing. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Better? Nope. So it's uh, so so the idea is like it would be independent for each uh, module. I think also being able to suppress doing a pre-release for a commit. I mean, there are some occasional commits that we do that really don't change anything. That uh, maybe documentation changes. We don't necessarily want to do a huge number of pre-releases. So being able to suppress that on the at, at the PR level might might be useful as well. Sorry, I didn't catch all of this. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, one thing I was thinking is is we often do. Um, PRs where there's not going to be a functionality change, there's might be documentation correction where we don't necessarily want to release a new pre-release module version. Um, just it just you know it doesn't really add anything. So being able to suppress that at a per PR level would be useful. You know, e.g. E using the specific commit tags. Yeah, actually might. that's a good idea. Uh, yeah, suppress. Release on on documentation change, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's something I missed. Thank you. It's because I was asleep, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so so Daniel, uh, it the the thing is, uh, you you don't have to have it for release. I think that would be a nice addition for people because that's something that some feedback that we had uh, previously, at least on the GSC resource kit, people don't want to have a release that changes too often because it's hard to keep track. Even when you pin, it's very hard to keep track. 
although it should be automated on their side, like there's no tooling widely used for automating this and testing their configurations against uh, the pinned version. So, so that's why we want to reduce that kind of noise while giving the opportunity for everyone to use a pre-release if they really want a pre-release. That's uh, that's obviously it's, and and we don't have to do like that's one option. We can have another option. I think we should probably I would probably take the text I wrote there and then maybe creating a GitHub issue so then we can have this discussion over a longer period of time of time. So I will send that in DSC community uh, dot org uh, website to say maybe this is the release process we're thinking about. Do you have any comment? And that would be like kind of an RFC. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense for sure. All right. Um, so keep an eye on uh, keep an eye on the DSC community dot org website, and I will add this in the probably tomorrow. Well, it's going to be today for me, but later. So uh, where should we put this? Um, where should we put the RFCs? I think we already had the question, but we don't know. Why do you want to see the RFCs in the DSC community website? Guidelines, maybe? Or maybe in the repository directly, the GitHub repository. Let's go. Yeah, probably right. the GitHub repository, right? Yes, so GitHub DSC community. So. So we'll put I will I will put the RFC so I can send to Daniel after this when I've put it, but I want to make sure people can just come and, and see what's going on. So we will find a way to put it there. Make sure you check again uh, the website. Or we will explain this. Actually, we will document this in the website, uh, probably in one blog post or, or help. And then and then you can just um you can just follow uh, the RFCs and how we do uh, how we will do RFCs uh, going forward for the DSC community. We will just copy what the PowerShell team does anyway, to some extent. All right? Do you have any more questions? Not only Daniel, anyone. Thanks, Gail. No worries. You're welcome. All right. If anything else, uh, feel free to add it to the next call and feel free to just come on the Slack channel and talk to us if we miss something. Yeah, if it, usually if there's news, uh, we try to first uh, get them on the Slack channels and then we just summarize them for the next uh, community call. And uh, next week is PSConf Asia. Uh, so feel free to keep an eye on uh, on Twitter, and we will probably, and that depends on the setup. I'll actually I have a call tomorrow about this. Uh, we're probably going to be streaming some of those. So obviously time zone is going to be an issue for some of you, but uh, keep an eye on this, and we will stream some of the content and sessions. All righty. Good. Thanks, Gail. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye.